Well, let's uh, <clears throat> open up to the book of Acts, chapter 19. Uh, we continue with our series with uh, the book of Acts, looking at the life of the early church, the apostolic church. Uh, this is the 57th sermon of our series, Acts chapter 19, and we'll be reading from verses 1 through 7. We'll be reading verses 1 through 7 uh, as the sermon title is The Power of the Holy Spirit. The Power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so let us uh, again keep this in mind as we come to God's word with reverence and awe as the public reading of God's word takes place now. Acts chapter 19 verses 1 through 7. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. Amen. This ends the reading of God's holy word. <clears throat> well, uh, today actually marks the 25th year of God's faithfulness to Theophilus Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And so we're uh, very grateful. Uh, here we are today as we reflect over the years uh, that God has continued uh, to show his loving kindness to us. And so, uh, sort of with that in mind, uh, we, we approach this part of the book of Acts. And as we think about the church, uh, particularly, uh, what I'd like you to think about is, if you were to summarize this entire chapter, what one single word would you use? Now, obviously, we didn't read the whole chapter, so uh, it may, you may find it difficult. Well, what? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, but I, I would encourage you to maybe take the opportunity this week and read the entire chapter. Read all of Acts 19 and try and think of one word that would summarize this entire chapter. Well, we're not going to end here and then wait till next week to get into it. Um, I, I would suggest that the one word that really I think summarizes this entire chapter, if you could, when you think about Acts 19, I do want you to think about this word power. The word power. Uh, Acts 19, I think, really does summarize, or really can be summarized with this word power. Right? It's the power of the gospel extending itself to the far reaches of the Roman Empire, to the far reaches of the ends of the earth. Jesus is establishing his church throughout the world. The gates of hell will not overcome the church. The key here is that what Jesus said would happen then is actually happening. There's power in Jesus' word. And for that reason, we need to understand what's happening in Acts 19 at Ephesus here in verses 1 through 7 within this particular framework. And so we have the Apostle Paul coming to Ephesus at the start of chapter 19, right? He spent some time in Galatia and Phrygia uh, back in chapter 18, verse 23. And that was the start of the third missionary journey. But now we have him fulfilling his promise, right? Fulfilling his promise as he returns to Ephesus now at the start of chapter 19. And he winds up staying here in Ephesus for three, three and a half years which now turns out to become the longest stay of all of his missionary journeys. Right? During the second journey in Corinth, he stayed there for 18 months, which was also the longest stay he had done up until that point. Now, as we look at our passage, we're told that Apollos is no longer at Ephesus. Right? He's now moved on to ministering in Corinth. And so this is Luke's way of telling us what we're now seeing in chapter 19 doesn't have anything to do with Apollos, 
We're moving on here. And so what we're told is that Paul comes to Ephesus and he meets some disciples, right? which according to verse 7 is there's about 12 of them. So there's about 12 of these uh, Ephesian disciples. And we're given one of the strangest situations in all of the book of Acts. Right? There's actually a lot of strange situations. Well, this happens to be one of them. Paul, out of the blue, right? we're not even told the context. It's just boom. Verse 1, Paul says, have you received, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were baptized? And they answered, no, we, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Right? They go on to explain that they've been baptized into John's baptism, right? John the Baptist baptism. And then Paul goes ahead and baptizes them, laying his hands on them as they receive the Holy Spirit as they prophesy and speak in tongues. We see what's happening here, and we have to wonder what is going on. All right? And how does this even connect with the whole notion of power? Well, to answer these questions, what we're going to do is go through these seven verses with the following three points. The first point is remember the Acts roadmap. Remember the roadmap. Remember the roadmap for the book of Acts. So that's point one. The second point is, what sort of city is Ephesus? Right, we're, we're here in Ephesus. What kind of place is this? That's our second point. And then the third point is what this passage then is about and what this passage is not about. Because there's been a lot of misunderstandings based upon this scene here in verses 1 through 7, and it is not about that at all. So we're going to look at what is this passage about and what is this passage not about. So with our first point, again, we need to remember that there is an Acts roadmap. There's a roadmap for us to understand the entire book of Acts. What do I mean by the Acts roadmap? Well, it's found just before Jesus ascends into heaven, back in chapter 1, in verse 8. What does Jesus say to his disciples? Right? After the resurrection, he spends some time with the disciples, and then he ascends into heaven. But just before ascending, or literally on his way up into heaven, what is Jesus saying to his disciples? Acts 1.8. But you will receive power, and there's that word power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Right? This is the Acts roadmap. This is the roadmap, the framework for us to understand what's happening throughout this book, and particularly here in chapter 19. Luke records this verse to show us what the power of the Holy Spirit is going to look like as we proceed, as we make our way on this roadmap. And so Luke describes the work of the church. Luke describes what Christ is doing through the church, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? We see the work that is happening through the apostles, through the disciples. And what's interesting is the way that the disciples, the way that the apostles, the way the church works, there's a similarity with the appearance of the Holy Spirit as if instruments of the Holy Spirit, right? Christ from heaven is ministering through the Holy Spirit, through the instrument of the church. And so if we look to the very first instance of the power of the Holy Spirit, we come to Acts 2. Acts 2, and the disciples are where? They're in Jerusalem. They're in Judea. And they experience Pentecost. The house where the disciples were sitting become filled with the noise of a mighty rushing wind, or, or sometimes it could actually be translated as a mighty rushing spirit from heaven. The disciples then are filled with the Holy Spirit. The way in which we see the Holy Spirit being described, the disciples are now filled with that Spirit. And then it goes on to say that the Spirit appeared in the forms of tongues of fire. And what happens to the disciples? They start speaking in tongues. We're told that the Spirit descends upon the disciples with a noise, with a great noise. And then we hear the disciples uttering 
noises. The whole scene in Acts 2 is meant for us to see the church in parallel with the Holy Spirit. The power of the Spirit has descended upon the church. And these disciples then are being refashioned, retooled, renewed, restored, transformed in a way that they will be properly equipped and prepared to be witnesses of Jesus Christ with power. And so the next time we then see the Holy Spirit is when? The next time we really see the Spirit moving in such a way is in Acts chapter 8. And guess where this takes place? Roadmap. Think roadmap. Jerusalem, Judea, Acts 8, Samaria. The apostles Peter and John actually come from Judea, come from Jerusalem to baptize the people in Samaria that were uh, preached to by Philip after Philip has preached the gospel and brought about these conversions. Then we get to a couple chapters later in Acts chapter 10 and what happens there. The Spirit descends upon Cornelius, a God-fearing Gentile, at Caesarea. And what does Peter say when the Holy Spirit descends like this? The Spirit with power, the power of the Holy Spirit descends in uh, Caesarea upon this God-fearing Gentile. And so Peter says in verse 34 of Acts 10, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation... Anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. In other words, we have this movement from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. And this movement from exclusively Jewish people to now incorporating Gentiles as to who makes up the people of God. So we have this movement of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's power being geographic, right? Location, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to also the inclusion of a wide variety of diverse ethnicities from all nations, peoples, and tongues. So that now when we come to Acts 19, Again, ask yourselves, think, Acts, roadmap. What's the movement? Paul comes to Ephesus. He comes to Ephesus. The ends of the earth. An area that is outside Jerusalem, outside Judea, outside Samaria. And he comes to disciples, presumably, of John the Baptist. Right? They could be Jews. Maybe they're not. We don't know. And quite frankly, it doesn't really matter. Because the Apostle Peter already in Acts 10 has acknowledged that in the church, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. People from every nation, tribe, tongue, and people are brought into the church of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Acts 19, the focus is on the confirmation of the Holy Spirit's power at the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit's power outside of Jerusalem, outside of Judea, outside of Samaria. Proof, tangible proof that the Spirit dwells outside of these locations so that the Spirit of God The Spirit of God, the presence of the Spirit of God can be outside of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Christ's church, with the Spirit dwelling in the church, goes as far to the ends of the earth, found even in Ephesus. (coughs) So that's the beauty of our passage today. We have the signpost in Ephesus of the Holy Spirit's power. The Holy Spirit's power descending in a place like Ephesus. The Spirit of God, the church of Jesus Christ, 
does not have to exclusively be in Jerusalem, Judea, or Samaria. We find the church of Christ Jesus. We find the Spirit of God extending further and further. The power of God extending further and further throughout the entire earth. And the gates of hell cannot stop her. Well, this leads us to point two when we think about the kind of place, the kind of place, the kind of city of, uh, that Ephesus is. Right? Why is it so incredible that the power of the gospel is reaching a place like Ephesus? Now, understand that Ephesus uh, is often described as the gateway into Asia. Ephesus is described as a gateway into Asia. It was a strategic city, much like Corinth was, to reach other parts of Rome, uh, of the Roman Empire. Right? A couple of weeks ago, I described uh, that Corinth is often, uh, is often parallel to, or, or, or is uh, described in a way that it seems like New York City. Well, Ephesus, often people will describe as being a lot more like Los Angeles, more like uh, out here in Southern California. Ephesus, located in Western, uh, sometimes you might hear it as Asia Minor, uh, which today is known as modern Turkey. Right? It's just across Athens, across the Aegean Sea, uh, the eastern uh, side of it. Uh, and so you have uh, Asia Minor, you have Ephesus uh, there. And again, it's considered an extremely important city. Just like in many ways, when you describe Los Angeles as sort of the, the beacon, the, uh, the, the city to penetrate the western half of the United States. Right? That's how we understand Los Angeles. Well, Ephesus was thought, again, to be one of Rome's empire, Roman Empire's richest and most populous province because of its natural resources, location, and trade routes. Right? It had the most vibrant area of Greek culture. Again, this sounds a lot like Los Angeles. So from a tourist perspective, right, this sort of rich Greek culture, this sort of diverse nature of the city might be great, but the problem was it also created a very fractured society, one in which existed in the Roman Empire. And so because of this great variety of people and culture, there was a lot of competition of uh, of, of people trying to vie for influence. And so the idea of Christianity catching on in a place like this would seem improbable. And yet despite the fractured life, there was a strong unifying religious influence throughout the city. It's again very difficult to see how Christianity would ever catch on in a place like Ephesus. In fact, one of the great legends of Ephesus is that it was founded by the Amazons, right? That's a tribe of female warriors and that the city was actually named after uh, one of their queens, the founder, uh, Queen Ephesia. It's thought that one of these Amazon queens later on built and is still considered today one of the seven ancient wonder or seven wonders of the ancient world. Ephesus, in the middle of that city, you have the temple of Artemis, right? This wasn't just a temple. This was an architectural wonder devoted to the Greek goddess Artemis. She was the goddess of chastity, the goddess of childbirth, the goddess of hunting, the goddess of the wilderness, the goddess of wild animals. Right? This, she was one of the most revered Greek deities. She was also known as Diana according to her Roman name. Diana and Amazons. This temple was a significant part of the Ephesian culture and Ephesians took great pride in this temple. Now we'll look at this a little bit more in the following weeks but understand that this religious connection, this religious unity, uh, this religious life supported the economic and cultural life of the city. So again, it's a wonder how Christianity could ever take hold in a city like Ephesus. 
But that's the very point, isn't it? It's the very point in a place like Ephesus where the gospel of Jesus Christ would never, would seem like it could never take hold and yet God is going to do wondrous things. The power of the Holy Spirit is going to be manifested even in a place like Ephesus. And so it may seem bleak, it might seem hopeless, but let the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel in Zephaniah chapter 4 verse 6 serve as a vital reminder to us all. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. On display then in this chapter is nothing less than the power of God's spirit. This entire chapter is an unfolding of the Spirit's power through the gospel ministry to the outstretches of the world, fulfilling the promise that Jesus made, fulfilling the promise of Jesus' word, the power of Jesus' word being completed from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. See, this then gives us an idea of what's happening here. And what this passage actually is about and what this passage is not about. Because when the Apostle encounters, when the Apostle Paul encounters these 12 disciples, we're told that they are disciples. Right? That's a word that's typically reserved for Christ's people, his disciples. And then Paul goes on to ask if they receive the Holy Spirit when they believed. It sounds like they are Christians. But when they say that they didn't even know there's a Holy Spirit, meaning that they didn't know that the Holy Spirit had been sent, that Pentecost had actually happened, it makes them sound like non-Christians, which would explain why Paul then baptizes these disciples, right? And it seems strange. They've already been baptized by John. Why are they being baptized again? Right? This is why there are some people who have argued that these disciples are in fact Christians, and therefore what Paul did was give them a secondary blessing. A secondary blessing of the Holy Spirit. Right? And this secondary blessing enables them to speak in tongues and prophesy. And so they'll call this a second baptism, sometimes referred to as a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right? And in this baptism, of the, this secondary baptism, what's happening is you are receiving supernatural gifts. Right? The kind of gifts that you can only get if you get this second baptism because what it means is that you are further along. You're one of these advanced super Christians. Right? You're so advanced in your Christian faith that you've been given this secondary baptism. Another issue that comes up is what you find in verse 5 and the fact that they were baptized in Jesus' name. Right? Some people insist then that, hey, you know what? You can only be baptized in Jesus' name. Never mind the instructions that Jesus gave in Matthew 28. What instructions? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, you must be baptized in Jesus' name only. And so there are some people who will argue for that as well. Unfortunately, both of these views are taking a portion of the Bible and completely misunderstanding the point of the passage. And they're coming up with something strangely bizarre that has nothing to do with Acts 19 verses 1 through 7. The passage has nothing to do with the claims of these folks with these views. Again, you've got to remember the Acts roadmap. The Acts roadmap of chapter 1, verse 8. Remember Jesus' promise to give the power of the Holy Spirit to his disciples, to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so for these 12 people, these 12 disciples, to receive this baptism uh, this power of the Spirit in Ephesus. It is a visible demonstration 
a visible demonstration of Acts 2, of what then took place in Acts 8, and then in Acts 10, and now in Acts 19. This is the promise that Jesus made, that my church will extend throughout the world. The Spirit of God, the presence of Christ in his church will extend throughout the world and will not be exclusive to the land of Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, the way we see it in the Old Testament. You see, for these 12, they needed to get baptized. Why? Because it meant that the baptism of John the Baptist is fundamentally insufficient and inadequate for the church as part of the new covenant enacted by Jesus. John the Baptist in his ministry is a figure and work who belongs to the Old Testament era representing the last of the Old Testament prophets. This is why these 12 disciples, again, they needed to be baptized. They needed something more that John the Baptist was unable to give them. Simply put, John the Baptist's baptism was not enough for a new era with the church, with the covenant in Christ Jesus. So when Luke writes in Acts or in, in verse 5 <coughs> that they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, the contrast is between John and Jesus. It's not about being baptized in Jesus' name only. Right, that has nothing to do with this passage. Luke is contrasting John the Baptist with Jesus, the Messiah. It is a contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is a contrast between an old era with the old covenant, with Moses found exclusive in a particular part of the world that could not extend outside of that part of the world versus a new era and a new covenant in Jesus Christ with a new composition of the people of God that extends to the ends of the earth. Acts 19 is a description of what is happening in this new era for all of God's people. And we are witnessing this transition out of the old and a movement into the new with Christ claiming this victory. This passage is tangible proclamation of tangible victory. Christ's promises then are not empty. These are not empty promises. These are not insincere promises. These are genuine and sincere promises. And we're seeing the power of Jesus' promises being fulfilled even in the book of Acts when we see Acts 1.8 and that roadmap being fulfilled. The power of the Spirit descending in Ephesus. The gospel is moving forward and taking hold. This, people of God, is absolutely monumental. We are to see what's happening here in the passage and behold the power of God as the Acts roadmap is being completed. Nothing is going to stop the spread of the gospel. Nothing is going to stop Christ building his church. The power of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the gospel is seen with Acts 19. And as far as an application for us, how does something like this that happened 2,000 years ago apply to us? At the very least, what this should do is reinvigorate our confidence in Christ's church. Not because the church is somehow infallible in and of itself. Not because somehow the church has some sort of uh, supernatural powers and, and there's some sort of leader that you can completely rely upon. No. 
the church, with Christ as her head, our trust is in the promises that Jesus has made that the gates of hell will not overcome the church. Because the truth is, there are going to be difficult times, difficult circumstances that the church is going to go through. There are going to be times when the church will come across and will be extremely hypocritical. There will be times in which the church will come across as pathetic and weak, dirty and filthy, abusive. The church is going to sin at times and is going to make the wrong decisions over and over again. And you need only to look back over the course of history and see just how much the church has been guilty of numerous atrocities. And yet, by sending the Holy Spirit to rest upon the church, upon both Jew and Gentile, a church that is established throughout the entire world, we can be assured that the power of Jesus' word will be fulfilled. Jesus will continue to refashion her. Jesus will continue to transform her. Jesus will continue to sanctify her into the image, into his image. And so don't give up on the church because Jesus hasn't. Don't abandon the church because Jesus hasn't. Don't dismiss the church, because Jesus didn't. In fact, knowing, knowing the sinfulness of the church, and yet Jesus, it's precisely because of that. Jesus died for her. Jesus died for the church, and he was raised for her justification. And he will continue to sanctify her. He will continue to make her beautiful. He will continue to cherish her. Those are the words that we find in Ephesians 5. And the beauty of all of this is that he calls all of us to be part of this. Let us participate in this great work of cherishing the church, of beautifying the church, of making her pristine, let us take part in this work with enthusiasm and with zeal according to a proper knowledge. Let us enjoy glorifying our God while we beautify his church. Let us not be the reason the church then is being accused of hypocrisy. Let us not be the reason that the church is accused of being pathetic and weak. Instead, let us be bold in our faith, demonstrating the power of the Spirit, even as Gentiles living here in America or wherever you may be, that we would be these witnesses for Christ Jesus to the ends of the earth. And that Spirit, that Spirit dwells within us. We have been given a spirit of power, not a spirit of timidity. A spirit that calls, allows us, empowers us to call upon our God as Father. With boldness, with assurance, with the power that Jesus Christ has given through the gospel. Let us continue on this journey, on this race towards heaven where we will see him face to face. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you again for our time together. Blessed be the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was, is, and it is to come. We do love you. We thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.